The Hopi Prophets, Prophecy, Ceremony and Culture by Thunderhands The precise origin of the Hopi is unknown, although it is thought that they and other Pueblo peoples descended from the ancestral Pueblo Anasazi, whom the Hopi call Hitsatsanam, or ancient people. Archaeology has revealed that some abandoned pueblos, such as Sikyakti and Awatovi, were once occupied by Hopi people. Hopi origin and traditions tell that their ancestors climbed upward through underground chambers called kivas and lived in many places before reaching their present settlements in this, the fourth world. To me, the word Hopi or peaceful ones has more to do with qualities of a person rather than just the race. These qualities would be transcendent, pure, and holy. They would also describe people of the earth and sky. They would have a certain aura of truthfulness in connection with one another. They would be kindred with their brothers and sisters and not disruptive. They would know one another by their energy and thoughts, keeping their vibratory levels in order and in balance. Let us begin with the ancient teachings of creation and emergence. Let us begin with the first world, Tokpela, which means endless space. The creator was called Taiowa. Taiowa's first creation was Sotuknong. The Hopi people say that they had an uncle and nephew type relationship. Sotuknong created universes, solids, waters, and winds. He also created Kakyang Wu Ti, Spider Woman. And so the creation cycle began. It is said that Spider Woman created beings with capes of white substance, which were called creative wisdom. When creating, she sang the creation song. These are the words to the song of creation. The dark purple light rises in the north. A yellow light rises in the east. Then we of the flowers of the earth come forth to receive a long life of joy. We call ourselves the butterfly maidens. Both male and female make their prayers to the east, make the respectful sign to the sun our creator. The sounds of bells ring through the air, making a joyful sound throughout the land their joyful echo resounding everywhere. Humbly I ask my father, the perfect one, Taiowa, our father, the perfect one creating the beautiful life, shown to us by the yellow light, to give us perfect light at the time of the red light. The perfect one laid out the perfect plan and gave to us a long span of life, creating song to implant joy in life. On this path of happiness, we the butterfly maidens carry out his wishes by greeting our father's son. The song resounds back from our creator with joy, and we of the earth repeat it to our creator. At the appearing of the yellow light, repeats and repeats again the joyful echo, sounds and resounds for times to come. The first two people she created were twins. The first twin's name was Pogong Hoya. The second twin was Palanga Hoya. She created both male and female eventually. 
with dampness on their foreheads and a soft spot on their heads. Spider Woman wove a web, an energy web, which could well indicate the meridians of the earth, which are made of energy, and the body, which are like a web of energy through which all things and beings are formed and all are connected. The two twins that were created by Spider Woman had special assignments. Pogang Hoya was to keep the world in order. Palan Gang Hoya was to activate the vibratory centers or chakras on the earth. Control them through th sound, sending out warnings and carrying messages. Activating colors red, yellow, white, and black. Now the first people were in awareness of the Earth Mother or Corn Mother being part of the Godhead or feminine aspect. So the Corn Mother plays a huge role and reverence must be given and blessings accepted from her. The Corn Mother represented Earth and Father Son represented the male aspect of the Godhead. They were universal parents of the cosmos. When a newborn child is brought into the Earth, there is a ritual of placing corn on the energy centers and keeping the child in a dark place with Corn Mother. All people learned they were citizens of the universe, members of an earthly family and tribal clan. They all had allegiance to the universe. One of the main energy centers would be called Kopavi, open door at the top of the head from which life was received. Medicine men worked on or activated the centers, eliminating sickness in body, mind, and spirit. Let us now talk about the worlds, their destruction and emergence from them. Tokpela was the first world in which all were created. The first problems began in Tokpela when when a personage named Lava Ihoya, the talker, in the form of a mockingbird, and Katoya, snake with a big head, misled the people by causing a division between them and the animals. Katoya also made people suspicious of one another, making war instead of love. So took Nong, the creator of Spider Woman, saw things were bad, and directed those through the energy center on the top of the head, again called Kopave. He directed them to follow a certain cloud and a certain star at night. They were chosen people. Eventually they were led to a big mound where the ant people lived. Ant people received them through the ant kiva. Kivas were a round hole in the ground. So eventually the earth was destroyed by fire while the chosen were hidden in the womb of the earth. So the people after the destruction and living in complete harmony with the ant people emerged into the second world, Tokpa meaning dark midnight. The second trouble began with trade and bartering. Everything they needed was there, but they wanted more. Things that they didn't need. Materialism. They forgot to sing praises to the Creator. A few people continued in singing the songs, and Sok Tu Nong heard it through their centers and the centers of the earth. He told them that Spider Woman said their thread was running out on this earth, a warning. 
So the third destruction began when the twins, who controlled the poles of the earth, abandoned their control, and the mountains tumbled into the oceans, and much chaos reigned. And again the people took refuge with the ant people in the Kivas, and the Ice Age began. Destruction. Soon the twins were told to reoccupy their stations. After a long time the people emerged, climbed the ladder from the ant kivas, and were told to respect one another and the Creator and sing in harmony from the tops of the hills. They emerged into the third world, Kuskurza. Kuskurza had properties. Its direction was that of the east, and the color was red. Chiefs upon it were copper, palasiva, and piva, tobacco. The bird was crow, or angwusi. The animal, antelope, or chuvio. After they climbed the ladder from their kiva into this new world, there was multiplication in large numbers, big cities. This created another difficulty. More and more they became corrupted. They used their reproductive powers in a wrong way. One woman became world known for dispensing favors in turn for turquoise necklaces. Many people made what was called patu. Volta, flying shields, round craft made of hides, attacking one another, war. Spider Woman came to save the spiritual ones by putting them in plants with hollow stems called reeds. She entered into the inside of the reeds with the people in order to save them. They had water and cornmeal. The world was destroyed again by water. The people used the reeds as boats, rafts, in the water, and came to a rocky island. All guidance was through the top of the head, or the crown chakra, the main energy point for speaking to the Creator. They traveled to many islands and lands, none of which the Spider Woman deemed suitable but at last landed on a shore with sandy soil. All the islands they had traversed were caused to sink by Satupnang, with a promise to re-emerge so people would know they spoke the truth regarding their journey. These were called land bridges. This was at last the end of the third world, an emergence into the fourth, called Tuwakchi. The direction being north, the color yellowish white, or Sik Yangpu. The chiefs upon it were the bird, which was an owl, and Meng Mao, the animal mountain lion, Tohapko, mixed mineral, Sik Yapala. This is the present world we live in now. It had height depth, heat, and cold, beauty and barrenness. The people heard a rumbling noise, and that is when they met a handsome man named Masa, the caretaker and protector of the land. He told them the new world was called Advia, backbone of the earth, and that migrations would begin. The back door of the land would be the north, and anyone entering through it would be severely taken care of, reprimanded, unless consent was given. So that is my narration of how things began, but now let us talk in a more relaxed manner about some of the things that we can get from this and some of the things that we can see from previous emergences and destruction of the worlds and some of the ceremonies and things that I am about to speak of. 
Now there's much to learn from these creation stories in my view. And the fact that they are stories is one thing and they most likely are true since the ancient Pueblo people, the Hopi, were around for maybe 20,000 years. They may not have been known by the name Hopi, but Hopi is the name they are known by today. And they came from a long time ago, ancient, ancient times. We see that their previous destructions were water, fire, and a polarity of the earth being taken out of balance. So we have to think about these things. We have to think about what element might be next. Could it be air? Because that seems like the logical the logical conclusion that I come to. We had water and fire and earth polarity and so I I had a vision that the next destruction could po very possibly be some type of solar wind or wind storms and as I delved further into my research I came upon other things that confirmed this feeling that I was having. We've also seen that through creation man has within him several psychophysical centers or energy centers called chakras. At each successful stage of one of his evolutions one of these come into play. For each stage there is created a world body in the same order of development of his own body. But now let us talk about migration because that's a very interesting part of the story. Now the migration began as pictured here and that's why you see this sign sometimes which is not a swastika as the Germans used later and they stole from the indigenous people actually a reversed version so they were given specific instructions from Massa who was for all intents and purposes the creator or the overlord of this newer world the fourth world and he described the manner of their migrations and what they would recognize. And all of these are on sacred scrolls, which I will mention later. Now the migration story in this new land we now call Turtle Island is an interesting one. I'd, I'd like to repeat it here and tell it to you. The people begin by climbing up on a high mountain with two insect people called Mayhews. They resembled the katydid locust, which is an insect that has heat power. When this was done, they were to undergo a test from a great bird called the eagle. Now the eagle poked an arrow to the eyes of the Mayhews, not touching them, but really close. They survived the first trial or test of the two tests that were given them by not blinking. Then the eagle decided that he was going to shoot an arrow through their body. But the Mayhew lifted a flute and began playing a sweet melody. The song is still remembered. There are ancient words that no one knows the meaning of. They are as follows. Kitana po, Kitana po, Kitana po, Kitana po, Aina Kinawe, Kinawe, Chilili cha, Chilili cha, Don Kavaki, Masi Kavaki, Kive, Kive Name, Hopet. 
Now this flute playing by the first insect and second insect morphed into what we know or was originally. There are many things we don't know, but this is where the god Coco Pele, the humpback flute player, came from. The fertility god, the Wuya. So the migration started in this sign here that you see here is a symbol of those migrations, an ancient sign. Spider Woman led a journey to the north with all the different clans and tried to break the back door open in the north by melting the ice by different means. This included the Flute Clan and the Snake Clan and the Fire and Sun Clans. They were unable to break this back door as Masal warned them not to. So when he found out he was very upset about it and he told them they would be punished. And so Spider Woman instead of retaining her beauty would grow old. But she would still lead the migration and the migration began to all the shores in the what we call America or Turtle Island and even down into South America so it was from shore to shore to shore to shore and that's why you find artifacts and pictures of Coco Pele the flute god and Kivas all over the North and South Americas and my belief is that all tribal people came from these ancient ones now during this time, Masa dispensed what we call the sacred scrolls of the sacred tablets to the fire clan. Yes, that is what is pictured here, so I will leave this picture up for a short while so that you may look at it and remember it. And you'll notice in the lower right hand corner there's two scrolls with pieces missing. These were the scrolls that were supposedly lost and to be brought back by Pahana, the great white brother, who is a mystery to most people. Now there was another deity, So Kwam Ho Na, and he was the deity of the Bear Clan, and he gave them three stone tablets. The Bear Clan would be the leading clan in the fourth world. Pictographs inscribed corn stalks surrounded by animals, two snakes, two rivers, and four men with outstretched arms, as you can see in the, the scrolls. These were holy men. Other tablets were given depicting clouds, deities, snakes, bear paws. And at the center of it all, corn, with a capital C-O-R-N. There is always this depiction of two rivers represented by snakes. They are assumed to be the Rio Grande and the Colorado. However, there is a much higher meaning, in my opinion. And in this might have to do with particular spiritual practices, energy practices. My belief is that the tablets are a code of sorts for those who have the power to grasp its higher meaning. Water also plays a major part of the Hopi beliefs and is represented with the ritual of the water jar or the magic water jar. There is a word which means water planted place or a place where water flows. The word is Paiuipi. Many of the rituals, instruction, and knowledge received through the tablet are in direct correlation to the great migration of these ancient people. Now Hopi land is often said to be very harsh as this picture shows of one of the main 
villages Oroibi out on the mesas in the Four Corners area, harsh environments with little water. But the Hopi people, people believe there's a reason for harshness and a reason for living in this area and they love this area. And that is so that their ritual and power that was given to them or in conjunction with the Creator could be relied upon to produce what was needed. Their reliance on the Creator was a sign of their supreme title to this land. In fact, the migration themselves were a purification ceremony that weeded out impurities brought from the previous worlds, which caused destruction. The animals and clans named after them were a big part of the whole picture of oneness with the creative forces, which they had been in alienation from in the past. This alienation was most likely a separation which brought to mind the importance of union with instead of separation from all forms of nature as we see today. There are many, many rituals and ceremonies that will be discussed but can only be touched upon just enough to give the listener a general picture. The ceremonies, clans, and whole worldview are so esoteric that few will ever understand the true meanings. Even some of the people themselves don't understand the meanings. But one must have the doors to the top of their head open to receive meaning and instruction and guidance. Here's another shot of Oroibi on the high mesas in the Four Corners area of Arizona. Before I go on to other things, I would like to discuss a little bit about the Bow Clan, which is a clan that was supposedly involved in wickedness and corruption and somehow caused part of the world's destruction in the Third World. Somehow they escaped the destruction of the Third World when they were left behind by other clans. This seems to be a mystery. But they appeared and followed the other clans in a migratory fashion. Now the chiefs of these clans gave birth to two girls, Suong Kana and Haolong Wa. Haolong Wa organized her own people and broke off into the Aeroshaft clan. She later tried to move to this picture you see now of the dwelling of Oroibi, but they were not permitted in. Now this clan caused trouble but also had great power with the Monko. The Monko is a symbol of supreme power and authority. They are held by three secret societies. The One and Two Horn Society, the Flute Society, and so I will discuss more on that later. Now the Kivas or the world below or the entrance to the world below which I mentioned before began with these migratory patterns or are observed in the migratory patterns and they're large enough to hold members of several clans and it symbolized the tenets of their belief system or cosmology. In the kivas was a small hole in the floor called Sipapuni, derived from the words navel and path from Mother Earth. This symbolized their emergence and led down to the previous underworld. There were various rooms, pathways, and pictographs or paintings in the kivas, all re representing a ceremonial purpose. Some ceremonial items would be the kachina masks, which embodied by spirits give them life. There is a sunken fire pit which represents this life. The latter from the kiva to outside represents another sipapuni. An interesting note regarding their spiritual beliefs 
and the kiva. The priestly class always sits below the people in an act of humbleness, as opposed to the priests of Christianity who always place themselves above the people in a hierarchical position. Let us discuss some of the implements used in some of the ceremonies. Pictured here is the paho. P-A-H-O, paho, a prime requisite for all ceremonies and an object which is referred to as a prayer feather. It's usually made from any kind of feather but an eagle feather would be the most prominent one and one of the most beautiful ones. So this is a very beautiful implement used and represents both male and female. One of the meanings being that the Creator is both male and female. The other sacrament would be the Corn Mother and Corn. The Corn Mother and Corn itself plays a major role in the lives of the Hopi and their spiritual belief. No ceremony or even life in general is without this sacred sacrament. It is another indication of the balance of the male-female aspect of the Creator and shows a close tie to Mother Earth. The Hopi assertion is, th is that corn was divinely created for them in the beginning of the first world and provided as a staff of life to continue through successive emergences into the second, third, and fourth worlds. Now the smaller ears of corn are given particular significance and their name is Soiwa. Corn is considered a unifying aspect of the male-female principles as mentioned before and the corn mother is considered an entity the same as Mother Earth. Cornmeal is used in many and varied ways on a continual basis. It almost goes without saying that cornmeal plays an important part in the lives and all the ceremonies. Corn is also seen as our own body as we eat it to sustain us. It's ironic that modern companies are violating another natural law by genetically altering the makeup of corn. Let me say a little bit about the ceremonies and one thing I want to say is that it would take 10 hours to try to describe all the things that go on in the different ceremonies so I'll just give a brief rundown of what they are and what they represent. And these are the ceremonies. The Wu Wu Chim. These are the, is, this is one of the first of three great, great ceremonies and it occurs in November and portrays the three phases of creation. The purplish dawn, when the shape of man is first outlined, the yellow light of dawn which reveals man's breath, and the red sunrise glow in which man stands proudly revealed in the fullness of creation. This is the ceremony of the Wu Wu Chim. The second great ceremony is Soyal, meaning so all and y'all year. This is again the second great ceremony at the winter solstice and symbolizes the second phase of creation at the dawn of life. This ceremony confirms the pattern of life development for the coming year. And within it we have the Kachina night dances where the first of the Kachinas or spirits come from the stars via the San Francisco peaks in the Four Corners near Flagstaff, Arizona. They come to help the growth of life after germination. Now the three major sum, summer ceremonies are Niman Kachina, the going home of the Kachinas after their appearance and their help during the winter. Next would be the flute ceremony. This simple ceremony embodies in song and symbolism the whole pattern of man's emergence to the present world. 
This ceremony is held every other year, alternating with the snake antelope ceremony. Now the snake antelope ceremony, this ceremony is one of the most spectacular because of one of the dances called Chuativa or snake dance. This is where the participants dance with rattlesnakes in their mouths. It is the least understood of all ceremonies but its meanings, its deepest meanings lie hidden within a dark primeval mystery perhaps unfathomable to even its modern participants and following that would be the yaya ceremony this ceremony is described as a magic fire ceremony this ceremony is also shrouded in mystery but is connected infinitely, in, infinitely to the inhabitants of the Aztec Chaco Canyon and other ancient ruins now to finish out this video, and it will take a while, we're going to discuss prophecy and what you see here is prophecy rock and everything that I have mentioned, the ceremonies, the creation of the worlds, all the different things that I had mentioned up to this point are to shed light on prophecy. In fact, all their stories, their whole life, their whole being, I believe, is steeped in messages through stories, messages that we need to look at closely. Now, like I say, I'm going to give different takes on it by what different people have said and what the elders have said themselves. However, I think many things are hidden and many things need to be reflected upon and mixed in with their whole history, their whole cosmology, their whole belief system. And believe me, these people are ancient, ancient people. They were far advanced. Anybody that knows anything about the chakras and the energy systems and the movement of energy and talks about flying discs and the kachinas coming from the stars. You better believe that these people are deep and what they have to say should be listened to with reverence. In my mind the Hopi people are the most spiritual people on the planet. They may be the seeds of the planet their civilization is goes so far back we don't know what the beginnings are nobody knows and their prophecies are detailed they're not hit and miss but I will start and I will call this take one on prophecy rock and this is what is said about it now this is near Oroibi Arizona and it's a petroglyph and it symbolizes many Hopi prophecies and some interpret it in the following fashion the large human figure on the left is the great spirit some say it's Masa the bow in his left hand represents his instructions to the Hopis to lay down their weapons the vertical line to the right of the Great Spirit is a time scale in thousands of years. The point at which the Great Spirit touches the line is the time of his return. The life path established by the Great Spirit divides into the lower narrow path of continued life in harmony with nature and the wide upper road of white man's scientific achievements. The bar between the paths above the cross is the coming of white men. The cross is that of Christianity. The circle below the cross represents the continuous path of life. The four small human figures on the upper road represent on one level the past three worlds and the present. 
On another level, the figures indicate that some of the Hopi will travel the white man's path, having been seduced by its glamour. The two circles on the lower path of life are the great shaking of the earth, World War I and World War II. The swastika in the sun and the Celtic cross represent the two helpers of the Pahana, the two white brother. The short line that returns to the straight path of life is the last chance for people to turn back to nature before the upper road disintegrates and dissipates. The small circle above the path of life after the last chance is the great purification, after which corn will grow in abundance again when the great spirit returns and the path of life continues forever. The dots represent the four corners of Hopi corn, or the four colors, excuse me, of Hopi corn and the four racial colors of humanity. Now, I will give you take two. And on take two, part of it is my take. I have done much research from different resources. And that coupled with my own intuition or my own intuitive powers and my own communication with spirit has led me to believe some of these things are true. And they are proving themselves to be. But like I say, I've gone to many resources. Now, some of these are things that have been said and others are thoughts of mine. World War III will be started by the people who received, first received the light. What is the light? What does that mean? And these people could be India, China, Egypt, Palestine, Africa, any of those. It is said that the only homeland of the Hopi is here and will be preserved as an oasis to which refugees shall flee. It is only materialistic people who will seek to make shelters or bunkers. Now the real shelter will be those who are at peace in their hearts that will be the only shelter there is, a shelter for, from the evil, to stay away from the evil. It will be a metaphysical shelter. It won't be a physical shelter. Those who will survive will be those who take no part in what's going on in the world regarding ideology or race and the division that's being caused by the ones who perpetuate this kind of thing. I have always believed that the war or emergence will be a spiritual conflict with material matters. Of course there may well be a horrendous physical component and I'm sure there will according to the Hopis themselves, but it will be a spiritual conflict with material matters. The time will be with the coming of the Blue Star Kachina, which is spoke of, or Sakwa Soha. He will take his mask off and dance in the plaza. Many have said that this Blue Star has already appeared, but I believe that the blue star is yet to appear and might reference several things. The people that survive will be humble people, people of little nations, tribes, and racial minorities. There will be plant forms from previous worlds and they're already starting to spring up as seeds. Also, these seeds are in the sky as stars and in our hearts. All are the same depending on how you look at them. But the great white pahana is the biggest mystery. 
Some believe the great white Pahana is not from the earth at all, but from the stars. This would make sense. And I'll just leave it at that for now. As for the magnitude of the problems we face, who can we rely upon to tell us the truth? Industry? Governments? Have they ever? In a global sense, we have jeopardized our own existence by waiting too long before we have faced facts. Hopi prophecy is broader in scope, more comprehensive in details and tells us why we may have waited too long or maybe what we can do about the future. Prophecy comes from Creator, remember that, not people. Just two or three righteous people will be able to fulfill the Creator's commission, maybe even one. Corruption of the Hopi by the white man and his ways is a big danger. There have always been splits in the Hopi community. There have always been the traditionalists. And then there are the progressives who want to take on some of the white man's ways, some of the modern technology, some of the easy devices instead of relying upon the creator. Some must carry this torch because the Hopi community is dwindling and remember what I said at the beginning of this video is that Hopi is not just a people but it is a way of thinking a spiritual way of thinking and they were here to show us this they are here to show us they are still here but we must help them we must think like they do. We must follow the prophetic instructions. We must delve deeper into what the meaning behind them is. But it's pretty obvious. Now some of the other signs that might be seen or are said to be appearing in, in the time of when it's critical are, are things like halo of mists around heavenly bodies. Well, we have already seen that. There has already been that. Big changes in weather. Well, of course we've seen that because we have summer in the winter and winter in the summer. And then they actually speak of how a war will be dis started against terrorism. They actually speak of this. A war to save the innocent and punish the guilty. But the question is, who are the innocent and who are the guilty? When we speak of materialism, modern man began to depend on the money system rather than food. Such things will become useless. Money, technology, industrial machinery will come to a standstill. When the world of the common man realizes that their leaders have failed, they will be hunted down like animals. This is spoke of. In turn, the leaders will turn against each other. Now, something else that is spoken of is liberators that will come from the West and drop from the sky like rain and have no mercy. Now the Lakota people believe in the four directions as do the Hopi people and other people and the Wakanyan come from the west, the thunder beings, and they are in control of wind and storms. And I mentioned at the beginning of this video that out of all the destructions, wind seems to have been left out. And so I feel like wind will be a element that will be employed along with all the other things that have already happened in the previous destructions. And whether it be a solar wind, which we are having now, 
or winds and storms on the earth which are unprecedented right now. These are some of my thoughts that this emergence and some of the destruction will be from wind. Now the gourd of ashes is spoken of repeatedly and I firmly believe as is said by them that radiation will be a destructive force also. It is said a sudden eruption will explode in the midst of their follies. It will gl glow brighter than the sun. It is said the earth will turn over four times. It is said they will end up in the lowest darkness crawling on all fours. And at that time, the spirits of the ancient fathers will return, the Kachinas, the supreme Kachinas. Prophecy and the destruction of this fourth world and the emergence and to the fifth is the big question every wants, everyone wants answered, but little take the time to investigate. There are many dimensions to what the Hopi have to tell us, and they have told us over and over, not only through literal words, but through the wonder of their history, cosmology, and ceremonies, like I said before. The hard facts are that man has assured himself of destruction and emergence through his out-of-balance attitude and complacency towards his literal land and the makeup of his world. It is easy to see through the history of the different worlds and their destruction what is the root cause of all the problems on the earth from the beginning of their emergences, that it all started with separation from the animals and nature, and materialism came into view. That is exactly why every waking day of their life is spent on ceremonies in regard to nature. Now the first mistake in the beginning was the fall from grace or whatever word you wish to use from adhering to the Creator's way. And when I say Creator I mean the male-female principle that governs the universe. The first through third worlds were destroyed, as I said before, by fire, ice, water, polarity shifts, interruption in the balance of the electromagnetic fields. And remember, there is no separating man from this precious earth because it is an extension of our body, just as are the animal kingdoms and the rest of nature, including rocks, trees, and sky, and other beings called men. The earth has all the same energy centers or chakras that the body human has, as explained by the Hopi people. Energy centers were misused at times, and in particular the lower chakra, or the reproductive centers. My sense or take on this energy centers of reproduction being misused, my take is that it has something to do with a materialistic purpose only or for enjoyment only without realizing the sacred component. That seems to me what the problem was because it certainly isn't that sex is bad or wrong or enjoyment but as regarding all the sexual energies this one should be revered and is respected as sacred it is through the planting of the seed just like the flute playing we a medicine man Coco Pelli planted seed from the hump or bag on his back this planting of seed and Regeneration is a constant theme in the Hopi's worldview, and we see it in the Corn Mother and so forth. So proper respect is, is in order as well as realizing the power and the energy from this lower chakra to raise consciousness up and activate other higher energy centers, such as the door to the top of the head. 
But today you see both men and women using this center for gaining materialistic advantage and for control, for control instead of for the sacred unification and oneness with themselves and the Creator. You know, this oneness not only bears a physical child, but a spiritual one as well. There is a whole other aspect to union as seen in other sacred traditions such as Tantra from the East. And there were sacred initiations in societies within the Hopi considering sexual practices. The Hopi certainly were not uninformed in these matters and were actually quite sophisticated in their practices. One of the societies, the Dumeya, was one of a underground nature or a secret nature but there were things that were done by some of the participants such as the young lady pictured here now having her hair up like that instead of long indicates that she is past the age of puberty and more into the age of knowledge about such matters. Just for a little insight, sometimes girls and older women would initiate this Dumeya practice by letting the boy or man of their choice know they were interested. And the boys as young as 12 sometimes would sneak with a blanket wrapped around them into a woman's house, so it is said. Males and younger men would secretly carry on several relationships at the same time, visiting the women on alternative nights. However, excessive sexual activity was frowned upon as misused and was to be used for purposes of learning and, and to be a good man to your woman or a good husband to your wife or a good wife to your husband. What was excessive to them may not be to what their standards were and coming from a dogmatic moral position but more from a natural one which would allow more freedom and less guilt. It was more of a learning experience like I say with the older sometimes instructing the younger. Sometimes women would want certain men to visit them and other times aunts or older women would instruct younger boys in sexual matters. All in all it became a subject among them as a light-hearted banner and a joking around or laughing about things experienced and learned. Not repressive but expressive in a healthy way. So when some of these things that you hear about why certain worlds were destroyed and, and the fact that it was misuse of certain energy centers doesn't necessarily mean the Christian dogmatic view as interpreted by m many but more of a view of not using it in a sacred manner. So that is something to think about. They had many practices and many names for these practices like getting advice from the wise called Tutavo could be anyone older than oneself. Didn't have to be necessarily an old elder but anybody that was older than oneself that you would seek advice from. Now getting back to looking at the destruction of the worlds and the cause of those destructions, we can determine a strong message as to what is coming and how it will come. Symbolism is the key here. These ancient people used a lot of symbolism in their life and so why not in their stories of destruction and recreation or emergence? One must look at the bigger picture all the things we see today causing imbalance 
which leads to destruction has been seen before in their emergence stories. Their worlds could not only be actual worlds, but in a sense worlds of thought to be passed on. The best way to pass on a teaching is through stories. Stories are never forgotten and are sometimes archetypes to be imprinted upon the minds of men. When the Hopis speak of the gourd of ashes or radiation or the sea turning black and all living things in it perishing or the giant webs that would encircle the earth, they are speaking of technology and, and propensity for destruction. When they speak of the flying crafts of previous worlds and war, they are speaking of not only literal events, but those shaping our world now. We have to remember that these people were so far advanced that they are what I call dimensional thinkers and travelers. Much of their belief systems, if not most, revolves around the stars and those who come from them. The sacred Kachina Katsitnam, or spirit. Who knows what dimensions have been traveled and what lessons have been literally learned. Their civilization were huge and far advanced, way beyond our comprehension. Nobody really knows where their origins were. As I said before, the one fact remains. They separate themselves from the outer world of Tatakura technology and have little use for it. They have done better without it. One can only surmise that a horrible lesson was learned from its misuse, or maybe a vision of future misuse was visited upon them in a very real way. You know, a lot of their visions and prophecies were seen through the third eye, which they also had a name for and a secret society for. Katai Ma Tokurve was a name for the third eye. People who had this ability could see things in the future and the past. Most likely most of their prophecies and stories came from these people who also had, like I said, secret societies devoted to these things. So in conclusion, I'd like to say we have seen many, many things happen and are happening right now as we speak concerning radioactivity and the sea turning black and the incident at Fukushima and other nuclear power plants, the weather changes, everything that they have spoken of seems to be coming to a critical mass at the present time. Their prophecies have informed us. Their elders have begged us. Will we listen?